Hey everybody, good morning. I'm Pastor Kennan. I'm here with Amber McCann and our great band, Eric and Chase, and we're thrilled to be with you. It's a beautiful Sunday and it's awesome to worship God. We're in a sermon series called, Who Do You Say I Am? Now let me just own it. We're gonna skip past the Palm Sunday reading in Mark because we're gonna circle back to that for Easter week. And so we'll come back to that. So our passage today is going to be set in, um, in Jerusalem, but it's going to be after Palm Sunday um, has already happened. And it's really interesting uh, time because uh, Jesus begins to talk about end times. And I think that's going to be really interesting. Now we're, uh, we're in a series about identity. And so we're thinking about who Christ is and who we are in Christ. We've been going through Mark to understand better. And this really kind of brings everything together in this particular week because um, uh, Jesus is going to be uh, uh, um, identified as a man on a journey. And uh, so we're gonna talk about how that intersects. But when he starts talking about end times, I just wanna kinda get, uh, like, uh, get us into the conversation by asking you, like, what has been your experience with conversations about the end times? Uh, what, what has been your experience with church? What, is, what have you come to understand? Like, what do you think of? What images uh, d does that kind of conjure in you? Um, uh, tell me, what, what about you? What about I you? I think Amber? of like the movies, you know, like Terminator and like darkness and like, I, it's kind of scary. Yeah, <laughs> like right. I think of scary things. Uh -huh. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, that, that totally, it's good. Yeah, a lot of, lot of different things I've like kind of flashed through my head, but I've, I've always, you know, thought about the, the whole judgment aspect. What's that, what that's going to be like and, um, you know, hopefully seeing lost loved ones and that sort of thing. That's kind of, you know, mm. where my head's at with yeah. it. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, same stuff. Like zombies, like hurricanes. <laughs> Zombie apocalypse. You know, stuff like that. Like, you know, that's what everybody says, but, you know, I kind of like, like Eric's. <laughs> yeah. I've kind of come to, like, think that it's more of, like, a mental, spiritual, like, thing. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Like you know, I remember growing up, and so both of my grandfathers were preachers, and so I, I did a lot of church as a kid. Um, I, it was always going to happen any day now. You know, like that's what I remember about it. It was like, it's, it, it's going to be any day now. And uh, so I was always like a little freaked out by that because I was like, are we living in the end times? Like, is it really going to happen? And, and so, and then there were so many different ways that, um, that the rapture and things like that was presented. So it was, it was kind of a real heavy uh, topic. And, um, you know, the talks about tribulation and suffering and all of that. So for me, it was just kind of a, as a kid, it was just kind of a big, a big subject. And it was kind of hard to, to wrap my mind around it. And so, but Jesus begins talking about mm -hmm. this stuff. And he, he starts uh, warning that there are going to be false messiahs. And they're going to come and they're either going to pretend like they're him or they're going to pretend to be representing him. And so he starts talking about this kind of, of language uh, that, that they haven't seen so far. He spoke about wars and famines and earthquakes and, and all of these, you know, disasters and catastrophe type of uh, things. But what's interesting is... Um, None of these signal the end, if you really read this carefully, this material. None of it really signals the end. Uh, it's just kind of the beginnings of pain. And so what's interesting about this is it immediately started making me think about, you know, being in the hospital, about ready to give birth to a new baby. And just kind of how that peaceful room transformed very quickly into a room that had beauty and pain in it all at the same time. And so I kind of think that that's what Jesus is talking about is that there's, there's going to be beauty. Beauty doesn't cease to exist. You know, it's not like we're in the, the boiler scene of Terminator and, and the, and the robots got half of his face missing. Yeah. So like, it's not, but, but there's going to be a time that comes when when beauty and pain are going to be together. And 
and the pain shouldn't necessarily be um, be thought of as as horrific, although it can be, um, but it, it necessary in order for the beautiful thing that's going to happen to happen. And so I thought that that was kind of an interesting one. We're, uh, Jesus is talking about giving birth to a new age, a new time. Uh, there's going to be a turning point. Uh, and so, uh, you know, when he speaks of earthquakes and famines and things like that, it's not that they weren't already happening. They certainly were, and, and the Bible's full of, of stories about that. But, um, but it, it could intensify, just like labor intensifies um, as it moves along and progresses to birth. So he began to describe in detail the time between his uh, resurrection and ascension into heaven and the time that he would come back um, uh, as second coming. And so he began to talk about that, that there would be persecution for, for his followers, um, that, that the church would be persecuted. Uh, he talked about how uh, the gospel would penetrate the ends of the earth, like it would be spread way beyond anything that they could have imagined. I mean, remember back then they thought the earth was flat, right? I mean, you fall off the edge, right? But you know, it, so this would be a, this would be carrying the gospel to unknown lands and and places that they had never even dreamed of of being, had they known the scope and size of the planet and really understood that it would have even been more amazing, even more um, uh, mind uh, provoking uh, thought uh, for them uh, because you know they didn't have the, the vantage point that we have from the space shuttle, right? Uh, where we can look back at the earth and see how massive it is. So the idea that this gospel would spread to the ends of the earth was, was a big one. And then, um, you know, he talked about how there would be the Holy Spirit and that, that you didn't have to worry about coming up with the right things to say that the Holy Spirit in that moment would give you the things that you needed and, the, and would give you guidance and give you the things that, uh, that needed to be said. And so um, Jesus also talked about a very specific kind of pain, and that is the pain of the rejection within one's own family. You know, he says that brother will testify against brother um, that, that, that in this time and that, and that things like that would be happening and, so, and would come to pass. And so these really aren't signals for the end times. They're rather just descriptions of the context of them, that this, these are things that one could expect uh, between the time that he ascends into heaven and the time that he uh, comes back. And so it's simply kind of the environment in which these labor pains are all going to take place and um, giving birth to the new thing that God is going to do. And so we know some things from, from this. I don't want to get um, down into a whole bunch of you know prophetic uh, teaching here what i do want uh, to do is use a prophetic voice to talk to you about what we do know we know that the who we know that that jesus christ is the professed messiah right we've di we've discovered that and we've unpacked that in this series we know uh we know the how we know that there is going to be a second coming after his death and burial and resurrection and ascension to heaven he is going to come again in final victory. So we know that he's, he's, he's predicted it three times to this point now to his disciples and to the crowds that were following with him. And we know the what and the why. And that's because the world needs a savior. The world needs salvation because there's something that's broken in the world. There has been a fracture and a split and, and, and God is now participating in the healing and, and, and the restoration of the world into wholeness, into, into the way that it was intended to be created. And so we know even the where now based on this information. We know that there's going to be an environment of persecution. There's going to be an environment of proclamation. There's going to be a, a, a paraclete, a Holy Spirit helper that's going to be uh, involved in all of this, and there is going to be pain. So we know a lot up until this point now. So the big question that this passage is going to lead us into is when. When is this stuff going to happen? When is the second coming of Christ going to take place? So when I thought about Christ as a man on a journey, I thought about the, those family vacations 
that we all take at one point or another where you're all excited to go and so you pack up the night before and you've got everything ready and maybe just your your little kit is out with your razor and your your uh, shaving cream and your toothbrushes and stuff and and so I, I think about the excitement of a journey uh, of, of going somewhere uh, distant or far away and I think about all of the preparation that leads up to that and I remember uh, specifically my mom telling me now you need to be awake and ready to go at six o'clock. You know, I mean, she was very specific what the expectations were on on, on stuff like that. And so um, I think about that when when I think about this package, uh, this uh, passage. And so Amber is going to help us kind of unpack the scripture uh, because this is actually what Jesus says about when. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So this is in very uh, straightforward language. I mean, that's about as straight as get. About that day or hour, no one knows. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. So I think that, that we humans struggle here. I really do. I think that, uh, that we kind of think that we either do or can know everything. And so I think we really struggle with this idea of not knowing, even though he says, you're not going to know. I think that we don't believe that sometimes. And so I think that a lot of books have been written about this. A lot of dates have been projected about this. I know in my lifetime, I've heard, you know, dozens of times where Jesus is going to be coming back on March the 16th. You know, like, I mean, I heard it, right? Yeah. Haven't you all heard that? And so I, I think that it's funny where Jesus is like, you're not going to know everything, but then we think we're going to know everything. And so, um, anyway, this is kind of the, the crux of the verse uh, here, the passage. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work and commands, the doorkeeper to be on the watch. And and there it is. I mean, right there. That is, that is who Jesus says he is, a man on a journey. So, Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know... When the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or at cockcrow or at dawn or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly and what i say to you i say to all keep awake and so is that the big takeaway right we're, we're supposed to like be awake and, and be ready to go when this happens so it reminds me of that trip again and so you know i think it was so hard though for the disciples and for the crowds to wrap their mind around a, a allegiance to a leader who was not only always righteous, but who was always right. <laughs> and I think we do this with Jesus. I mean, I do it. Do you? Yeah. I could. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like shaking my head. I'm like, oh. You're like, God, really? I mean, yeah. you're going to do are this sure? or say this? or <laughs> Are you sure that's right? Like, I mean, have you ever done that, Eric? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it is kind of second nature to like to second guess or like you know try to think our way around things and 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 that's fine because like God intended us to to use our our logic and use our brains and you know but at the same time it's it's supposed to be aligned with with His will you know yeah with His example like that's how we really tap into um, living greater and that's what. And, and, and maybe some, I like that, I mean, yeah, maybe, I some, that. maybe some maybe uh, some reference to like, yeah. but Chase, I mean, isn't there any exception? I mean, don't we know something more than God sometimes? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Ask me the simple question. I was waiting for a different answer <laughs> from this guy. <laughs> so what's He's funny is, me. like, Jesus was so clear with them. Jesus is like, you know, there's going to be persecution and pain, and you're not going to know every single detail. And so... Despite all of that, you still have responsibilities. And I think that's really what's interesting here. And, and I think of it in terms of, you know, this is all about what happened 2,000 years ago. But what happens, though, is, is that the disciples are making disciples and they're passing the baton. And then generations go by. And so the baton keeps getting passed. And now we're a product of that we are a product of their ministry. 
I mean, think about how awesome that is. Like, like every disciple that they informed and formed disciples. And so it is just as if we are being made disciples by the disciples of Jesus. And so I think that's really uh, interesting. And so it's hard to hear, though, that we may not have it our way. Right, that that uh, that that doesn't stop us to have duties because I don't know about you, but sometimes ministry is hard, right? I mean, isn't it? Haven't we suffered enough, Amber? It's been a crazy year in ministry, yeah. right? Haven't we served enough, Eric? I mean, we've done it in a billion different ways. I can't tell you how many times we had the plan A and we went immediately to plan B because stuff kept happening. I mean, haven't we endured and strived enough, Chase? And haven't we? It's been a hard year. My office was burned down. <laughs> you know I mean? Along with my colleagues and their offices. I mean, our church uh, suffered uh, losses. Haven't we waited long enough? I mean, 2,000 years? I mean... <laughs> How much more can we take? Aren't we entitled to the kingdom yet, Amber? I'm getting impatient here. I mean, when is enough enough, right? Have any of us told Jesus enough is enough? Have you ever gotten into that conversation with him? Like, I can't take anymore. I can't come to church on Sundays anymore because I don't have any time in the rest of my week, you know? I don't want to serve you. Don't you have other people who can do that? Why should I give? I like to know where every dime of my money goes. Why should I give it to someone else to spend? According to Jesus, though, in this passage, when is enough enough is the wrong question. <laughs> he already said you're not going to know. <laughs> so he in true Jesus form, does what he always does. He makes it simple for us and gives us a simile. He said, think of me like a man on a journey to a distant <laughs> land. And here was his point. He was leaving. He was leaving the earth. And he was about to leave his disciples something. And the first thing he was gonna leave them was his house, the church. And so he was going to go away and the church would be in their hands until he returned. They knew who, what, where, how, all of these things, even why, but they did not know when. And that's where we come in. They could have never imagined that 2,000 years later that we still don't know when. They could have never imagined that. And we probably can never imagine when it's going to be either. But Jesus is clear. This is in our hands now. The baton has been passed to us. And so Jesus didn't just give them the ministry, though. Jesus also left them the power. They left them his authority. He knew that they were going to need to go and spread the good news to the ends of the earth. How else would the church continue for this long? How else could that happen? He knew things that they couldn't have imagined. He knew that those disciples were going to have to go and they were going to have to make more disciples and that they would have to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He knew that. And now the church has done it for 2,000 years since his death and resurrection. And the only way that the church could do something that huge and big is because we operate in his power, with his authority. Now, we ourselves are not saviors. That's a done deal on the cross. Yeah. <laughs> only Jesus can do that, right? But we do extend his love <laughs> and we do extend his grace into the lives of others. In our own lives, we receive it. And we do that through acts of reconciliation. He, he left it for us. And we, friends, we can't do that sitting on church pews. 
but can't effectively do that. So it's not good enough to just sit and listen to messages about Jesus. We have to do something. Like a man on a journey to a distant land, Christ not only left his house and his authority, but he left us work and responsibilities. The earth still needs God's continual care. It needed it back in the disciples' time, and it's still needed today. There would be more healing that would be necessary, not just then, but all the way till now, in order for God's promise for, for reconciliation and wholeness to humanity to actually be true. God needed open eyes back then that saw the opportunity for compassion and service, and God still needs our eyes to be opened for that same thing. God still needs us to answer the call, what God is calling us to, and God is still calling us, even in a pandemic, even when we're tired, even when we don't feel like it, even when we think we know better. The disciples then, and now us, were the hands and feet of Christ. <laughs> We've been given responsibilities to extend his grace and his mercy and Christ himself. <laughs> and so I think about the words that he uttered, Christ. You know what he said about us? You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world that cannot be hidden, so let your, shine, let your light shine before others. Let it shine so that they may see your good works and you may bring glory to your Father. <laughs> so the question isn't, when is enough enough? The question is, what is sufficient? And the answer is his grace. That's what we're here. That's the responsibility and the work that we're left to do. We are in charge of the house. We are Christ's church. We are the church. And then I think about what he said, very, very truly, I tell you, the ones who believe in me will also do works that I uh, do. And in fact, they will do greater works than these because I'm gonna go to the Father. And friends, I don't know about you, but it's been a hard year, but in the last year, we have launched three worship service experiences that are brand new, and all of them are online. We have one for children's, we have one for contemporary, we have one for traditional. There are three different unique worship styles. We do an adult Bible study in the evenings, and we've reached hundreds, if not thousands of people as a result of that way beyond our walls. I have a friend in India who watches our services, and by the way, he said he loves the band. <laughs> who doesn't? They're so amazing. We've sent families home with tens of thousands of pounds of food. We've sewn masks for frontline essential workers who are serving the pandemic needs. We've worked to eradicate hunger by not only nourishing the physical body, but the souls through our program that's fed nearly 35,000 people a hot meal and some hospitality. We've read and tutored the kids at Broadmoor Elementary who are behind because they've had to do hybrid classes during a pandemic. That's just to name a few of the things that go on. There are many, many, many other things. So the question isn't when is enough enough? It's what else can we do in the name of Jesus? Amen. <laughs> That's the question that we need to be asking. He said, I give you my work. Now go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We have things to do, church. We do. We have disciples to make. Our God said, I'm like someone on a journey. And I may come back at any time but you won't know when. But I want you to be awake 
and ready to go when the time comes. This is the expectation. So this really boils down to whether we're asking the right questions. Not when is enough enough, but do we know that his grace is sufficient? <laughs> Not when is enough enough, but what else can we do in the power and in the name of Jesus Christ? What can we do together? It's in our hands. Not when is enough enough, it's who will go and work to build the greatest kingdom of all, the kingdom of God, on earth as it is in heaven. How you answer that, that's going to determine the extent to which you are awake when Christ comes again. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.